Hello, everyone, and welcome to this opening session of the 2022 E. Maynard Adams Symposium for the Humanities. I'm Lloyd Kramer, a professor of history and also the director of Carolina Public Humanities. And I want to thank all of you for coming, those of you who are at this event in person, and also those of you who are watching on Zoom. I think we have uh, well over 100 people on Zoom, so I'm, I'm happy that you're here with us as well. This is our first opportunity to hold an in-person Adam Symposium since 2019 because the COVID pandemic forced us to cancel in 2020 and then move entirely online in 2021. But the quest for humanistic knowledge has faced many such challenges over the last 3,000 years. And the Adam Symposium also continues to flourish like humanistic insights and knowledge. So this is the fifth annual Adam Symposium, which we sponsor each year at Carolina Public Humanities to honor the longtime UNC philosopher E. Maynard Adams, who was the founder and early advocate of the public humanities and created the program in the humanities and human values here at UNC Chapel Hill. The program was established in 1979. So we've been organizing public events for more than 40 years. And we've changed our name uh, to Carolina Public Humanities. This happened about five years ago. And we now serve thousands of lifelong learners and teachers in communities outside of the university every year. Our mission is to foster public discussion of the humanities and to serve as a bridge between UNC faculty and the people of North Carolina, including teachers in K-12 education and partners in community colleges all around the state. And we seek to implement a key theme of the UNC mission, which stresses that Carolina is always of the public and for the public. And that shapes our mission. We also believe, like Maynard Adams often argued, that the humanities contribute to a vibrant democratic political culture and public life by encouraging well-informed public discussion, well-informed discussion. And these broad goals have shaped the themes of all of our past Adams symposia, which featured the philosophers Martha Nussbaum, Jeremy Waldron, Philip Kitcher, and Elizabeth Anderson. And this year's symposium, which is entitled Social Class Differences and the Search for Political Solidarity Among Black Americans, extends the themes of previous symposia by focusing on the specific challenges that black Americans face as they seek to develop a more fully democratic and equitable American society. And we're extremely pleased to welcome Harvard professor Tommy Shelby to discuss these issues because he has written extensively about the ethical and philosophical arguments that help sustain long-term struggles to overcome the legacies and realities of racism and racial inequalities in American social and political life. This symposium exists because of the generous support of Crawford Taylor and the Taylor Charitable Trust. And we thank Crawford and other members of his family who are joining us today from Alabama through the Zoom live stream. Welcome to the Taylor family. The Taylor Charitable Trust also provides funds to support an interdisciplinary graduate student program called the Maynard Adams Fellowships for the Public Humanities. And this year's Adams Fellows are with us today. They're in the front row. And I would like to ask them to stand. Would all the Adams Fellows please stand and so that we can recognize you. These are the public humanists of the future. Just and <laughs> Thank you very much. They are working on projects that will engage communities around the state of North Carolina, and they meet regularly to talk about the public humanities. In addition to the Taylor Charitable Trust, I want to thank the College of Arts and Sciences, and especially our senior associate dean, 
for Fine Arts and Humanities, Elizabeth Englehart, for their support. The college has been a loyal supporter of this program. And other support has come from the philosophy department and the chair of their department, Matt Kotzen, who's right here. Thank you, Matt, for your contrib uh, contributions. And I also especially want to thank our colleagues here at the Sonia Haynes Stone Center for Black Culture and History for their support and assistance. And I especially thank the director of the Stone Center, Dr. Joseph Jordan, for his collaborative support in co-sponsoring the event in this venue. In addition to his leadership of the Stone Center, Dr. Jordan is UNC's Vice Pro uh, Provost for Academic and Community Engagement. The program is very valuable to us at uh, Carolina Public Humanities. He's also an associate professor, an adjunct associate professor in the Department of African, African American and Diaspora Studies. And today, just today, he received the General Alumni Association's Faculty Service Award for outstanding faculty service to the University of North Carolina and its alumni. Thank you, Joseph Jordan. And in fact, I want to ask you to come forward and just say a couple of words about this place and, and your, your presence here. Thank you, Joseph Jordan. Lloyd, and uh, thank you to everyone who's come. I was asked to use this mic because I think every mic, yeah, I think every <laughs> mic is different. Uh, uh, first, let me say that um, I am always impressed when we can do a program like this on a Friday afternoon. This to me kind of demonstrates what I've always loved about this institution, and that is the, the interest in knowledge and knowledge in the public interest has always been foremost. Uh, I come to you as director of the Stone Center, which incorporates the Institute of African American Research now. We are a combined unit and very, very happy about that. We also have been uh, very, very fortunate to have Lloyd as a friend who's always included us in programming, and we've been fortunate to be able to co-sponsor either from our side or from his side uh, different programs throughout the years. And Lloyd is one of those very, very quiet, very, very unassuming, but very, very substantial individuals that helps to keep things moving at this institution. And I'm very, very uh, proud to be able to call him a friend and a supporter. You are sitting in uh, probably one of the most heavily used rooms in the university. Uh, as many of you know, uh, this uh, room is used as a classroom as well. It also is one of the rooms, I see you shaking your head, so you probably sat in here at one point in time uh, for uh, one of the larger classes. I'm going to ask you to indulge me. I think I have three minutes. I'm going to give you a 30-second story, and I do this primarily for Claude Clegg, who says that each time he comes here, he finds out something new about the Stone Center. This was not intended to be a classroom. When we were building the building and trying to finish, I didn't have all of the money to finish it. So this didn't have any of the technology or anything that you see in here. So I got a call from the chancellor, who I think is waiting to speak back there. But this was another chancellor. And they said, can I come in and, and have a conversation with you? Or could you come over and have a conversation with me? I went over. And when I went in, there was a provost, three vice chancellors, and uh, two deans. So I didn't know what was about to happen. So uh, he says, uh, well, I, I understand that you haven't been able to get all of the money that you need to finish this particular room. And I said, well, you know, it's a slog. But uh, and he says, about how much do you think that would cost? And I said, I mean, you know, we're in the, the millions or so there. He says, I got a deal for you. I said, oh, really? Said, yeah. He said, how would you feel if I told you we will fully equip this auditorium for you? We will put in all of the technology. We will put in the screens. We will put in the, the most up-to-date speakers. And I was blown away. I was new here at UNC, and I had never seen such kindness. And he says, but there's one thing I need you to do for me. 
And I said, what's that? He says, we're running out of big classrooms. So I want to know if you'll let us use this. So all of the tablet arms that you see on here, uh, those weren't intended to be a part of this room. This was supposed to be a performance space and nothing else. But in the long run, we got microphones, we got the speakers, we had to cut a hole in the wall to bring in this particular screen because it wouldn't fit in the door. So if you want to talk about Apocrypha, uh, later on in life, you can say you're one of the few people that knows how this building got to be what it is today. So Lloyd, I want to say thank you. Tommy, we are so happy to have you here after waiting to, to bring you for the last couple of years. And I'm very, very happy that it's at the Stone Center that you're going to be speaking. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's an inspiration, a story that all you have to do to is go to the chancellor's office to get a million dollars. I'm going to follow in my friend's footsteps. Uh, thank you, Vice Provost Jordan, for that, um, for those comments and for hosting this event here. I also want to thank the staff of Carolina Public Humanities for all of the work they have done to organize this symposium. We have the best possible team at CPH, including those who are here today, Max Orr, Joanna Smith, Destiny Lee, uh, Vicki Breeden, Paul Benici, and Michaela Sinclair. And I should mention for those of you in the room that during the Q&A, or right now even, you have question little cards that you can write questions on and uh, they will be collecting those cards and reading the questions during the Q&A session afterwards. So that's what the little cards are for. So our goal at today's event with Professor Shelby and at tomorrow morning's Zoom webinar is to examine how ethical issues and the moral duty to promote social justice can and should influence the black quest for political democracy the struggle to overcome the legacies of racism in American culture, and the ongoing campaigns to achieve more social equality in American society. And these issues raise questions about the relationships between black social elites and impoverished black social communities in which many of the most vulnerable black Americans have to contend with poor schools, poor jobs, and poor health care. So how can the social and cultural and political solidarity flow between these very diverse black communities? These are the issues and questions that we'll be exploring with philosophical and historical perspectives during the symposium today and tomorrow. Now, the chancellor at UNC Chapel Hill has attended and greeted the participants in the Adams Symposium during every Adams Symposium event. And Chancellor Kevin Guskowitz wanted to be here today to carry on that tradition. But his many daily tasks and events have created a scheduling conflict. So he is joining us via a video stream to welcome Professor Shelby to Chapel Hill. So I'm pleased now to introduce Chancellor Kevin Guskowitz for some comments about this symposium and to welcome all of us to this event. And we have him right here. This is the 21st century, ladies and gentlemen. And I present to you, Kevin Guskowitz. Thank you, Lloyd. Good evening and welcome to the Carolina Public Humanities Annual Maynard Adams Symposium. It's wonderful to be together for this important event in the life of our university. This symposium honors the legacy of a former chair of the Department of Philosophy and faculty leader, E. Maynard Adams. His dream of a public humanities program was launched over 40 years ago, and we are seeing the result of his work and legacy every day here at Carolina. This symposium emphasizes the importance of the humanities for understanding and analyzing public issues, current debates, and public education. It's through the humanities that we understand ourselves and the world around us. The humanities give us essential knowledge and perspectives as we carry out our mission of service to the people of North Carolina and beyond. We are here today because of the dedicated work of so many, and I wanna thank a few of them now. Crawford Taylor and his family support this annual event and the graduate program that is associated with it, a Maynard Adams Fellows 
for the public humanities. To the Taylor family, thank you for your faithful support. I also wanna thank the whole team at Carolina Public Humanities for their work. And thanks to the Maynard Adams Fellows. We are honored to have Tommy Shelby from Harvard University as our keynote speaker at this symposium. Thank you, Dr. Shelby, for bringing your perspective to our Carolina community. And finally, I wanna thank you, Lloyd, for your service to Carolina. I hope each one of you enjoy the symposium and I will now turn it back over to Dr. Kramer to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Chancellor. I know this is kind of odd, we go back and forth, but here we are. This is a real deal, folks. We are here in reality, and those of you on the Zoom, we are now moving forward. So, our keynote speaker today is Professor Tommy Shelby, who is the Caldwell Titcomb Professor of African and African American Studies and of Philosophy at Harvard University. He's also uh, the chair of his department there, but uh, he's on a leave this semester to complete a book. Okay, Professor Shelby grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, and received his BA degree at Florida A&M University, where he studied philosophy, and he told me yesterday he also played on the university's basketball team. And I think this is a, a great combination for those of us at Carolina. We like to think of, it's not philosopher kings at Carolina, it's philosopher basketball players. This is the Carolina ideal. He went on to, uh, to receive his PhD in philosophy at the University of Pittsburgh in 1998, and then he taught for several years at The Ohio State University before moving to Harvard in 2000. Professor Shelby's teaching and research at Harvard focuses on social and political philosophy, the history of black political thought, the philosophy of race and social theory, and he has been very active in teaching both undergraduates and graduate students in all of these areas. But as I said, he has also served in key administrative roles, including the position of chair of his department. Professor Shelby has combined his teaching and administrative work with numerous and influential publication projects. And this research has led to a long list of distinguished articles and books, a far longer list than I can provide here. But I want to mention a couple of works that are especially relevant for the themes of this Adam Symposium. His, published, uh, his early published work, We Who Are Dark, The Philosophical Foundations of Black Solidarity, was published in 2005. And he expanded on some of the themes of this work in another important book entitled Dark Ghettos, Injustice, Dissent, and Reform, which was published in 2016. And I actually have a copy of the book here, which is available outside at a display from the Bull's Head if you would like to get a copy after the uh, presentation. He also has co-edited and contributed an important essay to a book entitled To, Share a New to Shape a New World to shape a new world, essays on the political philosophy of Martin Luther King Jr., which was published by Harvard University Press in 2018. And as I say, the bull's head will have copies of all of these books outside. He has also uh, been working on another book project that he will be completing later this year and which is part of what he's going to be talking about today, including issues of, of black solidarity. Meanwhile, he has also published many other important articles and books, including a co-edited collection called Hip Hop and Philosophy, Rhyme to Reason, and an important essay that compares the ideas and actions of Martin Luther King Jr. and Barack Obama, which is entitled Justice and Ra Racial Conciliation, Two Visions. So today, the title of his talk is, um, the exact title is, A Tale of Two Tents, Race, Class, Politics, and Solidarity. And we're very pleased that he is joining us for this event because he was originally scheduled to come here two years ago on, in March of 2020, but the great pandemic forced a cancellation in that year. But his visit this year represents another timely opportunity to analyze issues of racial justice and democracy 
with philosophical perspectives that we need as we continue to confront the complex historical legacies of racism here at UNC and across our state. So please join me in welcoming Professor Tommy Shelby for today's keynote address of the symposium. <laughs> Professor Shelby. One final request from the 21st century, please turn off your cell phones. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me OK? OK, good. Um, well, thanks, Lloyd, for that introduction. Um, very generous. Uh, and thanks also, also to the Carolina Public Humanities, good folks who were showed me great hospitality, taking care of me, getting me here, feeding me, making sure I was comfortable, and I appreciate that very much. Um, I should say that I, I like to think that I share uh, Maynard Adams' vision of uh, philosophy speaking to a, a broader public, speaking to a broader audience, taking up questions of public life. Um, it's something that I like to make myself as committed to and try to do work of that sort my, myself. I also think it's critically important that those of us who work in the humanities uh, not just speak to our students and to specialists in our fields, but try to help the broader public understand our, the value of what we do um, by sharing that in a way that's accessible to uh, a, a broader public. So I'd like to think that the work that I do is very much in the spirit of of, of, Maynard, of Maynard Adams uh, and the kind of work that he, that he did and sought to support. The work I do largely focuses on taking up questions of philosophy as they intersect with questions of black life and black thought. So most of the essays and books that I've written that bring together questions that arise in broader black letters with questions that arise in the discipline of philosophy. And uh, the lecture I'll give today is an instance of that sort of enterprise. Um, and I should also say that that makes uh, that, that interest in bringing together questions of, of philosophy and African African American studies uh, makes it especially uh, apt that I'd be speaking here in the Stone Center. So thanks for your hospitality to have for having me here. So this lecture tackles what I regard as one of the biggest challenges to contemporary black political solidarity, and that is class differences among black Americans. In light of such differences, many on the political left are sharply critical of black solidarity and anti-racist identity politics. They're convinced, for example, that this form of politics, if it has any value at all, largely serves the interests of the black professional classes. The black working class would, these leftists insist, do much better to find allies among the broader multiracial working class and in the labor movement. Such leftists also maintain that race-based politics wrongly subordinates issues of class to uh, issues of race, rather than viewing race and class as, say, inter of inextricably related and fundamentally structured by capital labor relations. I believe these criticisms are serious, and they merit a considered response. In fact, I share some of the skepticism that thinkers on the left have toward identity politics and anti-racist activism. But I generally think that they often take their criticisms too far, and consequently undervalue black solidarity. So in my attempt to show this, I'm going to draw on some insights from the great W.E.B. Du Bois and from my former colleague, Cornell West. One limitation of this leftist critique and central theme of, of my lecture is that it relies on a paradigm of solidarity with roots in the Marxist theory of working class politics. Now, this conception gives, I think, too much weight to the role of shared material interest in binding a group together politically, and therefore ignores other reliable sources of group cohesion. I think it gives too little weight to ethical considerations and moral virtues 
that sometimes dispose people to put aside their narrow self-interest and work for the good of others. So I want to distinguish three groups in the black population. So this first group is similar to what uh, Du Bois referred to as the talented tenth. Some of you may have heard this expression before. Now this is uh, the professional class. College education, high status occupations, and high incomes define them. These are the black doctors, if you like, the lawyers, the engineers, the public officials, the executives, the small business owners, and so on. I'm going to refer to them as, the black, as black elites or the black elite. The second group is similar to what Du Bois referred to in his book, The Philadelphia Negro, as the submerged tenth. Now, this group is made up of those in chronic poverty. These are black people who have very limited education and work experience, and many of whom are jobless, might be dependent on public assistance, and have access to only dead-end jobs that pay, typically pay below a living wage, where perhaps they earn income through activities in the informal economy. Now, the majority of black Americans don't fall into either of these two groups, either of Du Bois's tenths. They are instead solidly working class people employed in the formal economy. And their situation, while precarious in some ways, is not as dire as the marginalized black poor. But the black elite and the black poor are both relatively large groups. They provide a stark contrast and are often thought to be sharply at odds. The relationship between them is therefore, I think, a good test case for the viability of black solidarity in what might, one might call the post-Obama era. If black elite, black poor solidarity is possible, solidarity between the black professional class and the black working class, I think, should also be viable, as the division between these two segments of the black population is, is somewhat less antagon antagonistic. Now, whatever the merits of a Marxist class analysis, I think it's evident that a person's class position does not uh, strictly determine their political commitments. Even Marx allows that uh, what he called communist consciousness, while emanating primarily from the working class, quote, may of course arise among the other classes too, through the contemplation of the situation of this proletarian class. Now, there are black elites who are progressive, even radical, in their politics. And some, I think, have sacrificed uh, greatly to advance the cause of racial justice and to help other black people in need. Indeed, some of the harshest left-wing critics of black solidarity are themselves members of the, of the professional class, often holding tenure positions at elite universities. So I'm often left to wonder, do they regard themselves as exceptional? That rare breed of radical that can empathize and act with the working class? And if so, what, what accounts for this exceptionalism? Right? Now, if they don't regard themselves as exceptional, then what justifies their belief that other black elites could be brought around to, say, a similar position? We should note also that some among the black poor are, if you like, political reactionaries. Sometimes they prey on and exploit other vulnerable black people. As Cornel West reminds us, quote, there are numerous instances of field Negroes with house Negro mentalities and house Negroes with field Negro mentalities. So although we shouldn't ignore sources of class-based tension and conflicts of interest, it's important, nor should we romanticize the political consciousness of the poor and working class. Still, I think utopianism in the bad sense here is uh, a danger. Yes, of course, we can't be certain of a person's politics if all we know is their class position. But there might be, let's say, a strong correlation between class position and political commitment, such that skepticism toward interclass black solidarity is warranted. So we might put the question something like this. Do the differences in material interest, social status, and political power between black elites and the black poor make political solidarity between these two groups unwise or impractical. Now, in my 2005 book, We Who Are Dark, Philosophical Foundations of Black Solidarity, I suggested that the answer to this question is no. 
In particular, I argue there that black solidarity is still viable despite class divisions in the US black population and notwithstanding the geographic separation of black elites from disadvantaged black communities, sometimes called ghettos. But I have to confess that I'm not entirely confident about this, nor am I fully persuaded by uh, leftist critiques of black solidarity. So here, I'm returning to the subject to see if I can gain greater clarity and maybe in conversation with you to uh, come to some conclusions about this question. Now, I'm gonna consider five challenges to the viability of black solidarity. Some of these are quite old. They date back to the early 20th century. Some of them are more recent with roots in the civil rights or black power movement era. And some are new, coming in the wake of Barack Obama's presidency. So I'm gonna spend most of my time responding to the first two challenges. Don't get concerned if I go on for a while about those two. You're like, wait, there's, there's three more to come. Um, I'll be <laughs> much briefer with the other three challenges with the first two challenges as kind of background to them. So what's the first challenge? You could say the black elites, they don't benefit from maintaining solidarity with other black people. Some argue that it's not in the interest of black elites to commit to black solidarity or to, put racial, to uh, uh, push a racial justice agenda. Black professionals, despite the odds, have managed to succeed in a highly stratified and competitive US society and are largely insulated from the most burdensome and if you like lethal forms of racial injustice. They live pretty comfortable lives, often in integrated communities and they enjoy considerable social status. They get along reasonably well with other white elites and have been largely incorporated into the mainstream of American society. They're also keenly aware that playing the so-called race card or even proudly asserting Black Lives Matter tends to alienate and even anger some of their white peers, and that many whites regard black solidarity as actually racist. To be sure, black elites are sometimes subjected to racial insults and slights, sometimes called microaggressions, and racial bias, of course, might cost, someone, uh, cost uh, one of them a reward or promotion or a job opportunity and whatnot. But in the wider scheme of things, these are, if you like, minor inconveniences and temporary setbacks in an otherwise good and prosperous life. And all things considered, black elites may be better off downplaying racial issues than joining other black people in militant forms of resistance. That's the challenge. To address this challenge, I, I think we need a uh, working conception of solidarity. So what characteristics must a group of people exhibit to be correctly said to have solidarity? And I believe uh, solidarity has five core components. There's mutual identification, where group members openly empathize and publicly identify with one another. That's what I'm calling here special concern, by which I mean members come to the aid of others in the group, especially to the aid of the worst off among them, even if this might call for some personal sacrifice. There are common values uh, or goals here, a set of values or objectives are widely shared in the group and are generally known to be widely shared. There's, of course, loyalty. Group members stick by one another and abstain from actions that will undermine the group's basic aims. And finally, there is trust. Group members are confident that others within the group are doing or will do their part to defend the group's values and to advance its fundamental goals. Now these five elements comprise, if you like, a type of commitment. One that an individual might undertake or they might refuse to undertake. This commitment is a, a kind of pledge, it's a kind of vow, if you like, a way of sincerely binding oneself to others in a cause. Having made such a pledge, one's fellows in solidarity, comrades as we might call them, may rightfully hold one accountable. Solidarity has, I think, the same moral structure, whether the cause is racial justice or gender justice or economic justice or other forms of justice. Now among the moral 
duties that I think we all are bound by is what I'm going to call here the duty of justice. I draw on an idea from the great philosopher John Rawls. Well, this duty is understood as uh, a duty to support just social arrangements and to help bring about social justice where it fails to exist. If someone seeks to correct structural injustice, they're going to need, at least typically, going to need to do so in concert with other people. Because such efforts always face pretty strong opposition, it's generally useful and sometimes essential for those most directly burdened by the injustice to form bonds, bonds among themselves. The fundamental purpose or purposes for which these bonds are formed are mainly to advance the cause of justice, to defend group members against unjust treatment, and to provide in-group mutual support. Now, of course, third-party bystanders can make good comrades. And there may even be members of the dominant group who will defect and come over to the side of the oppressed. This happens. Yet, the most trustworthy and loyal allies are often, though not always, drawn from the oppressed group itself. Given their obvious personal stake in the liberatory effort and their mutual understanding born of the shared experience of subordination. I contend that it's the duty of justice that's the moral ground or foundation of black political, political solidarity. It is the fundamental principle from which claims of solidarity are derived. It's the primary reason why black people can be justified in making mutual, the mutual commitment of solidarity to one another. Now, I think some people might value or seek solidarity with others because of its intrinsic value. For example, because of the sense of community that it provides. However, I think it's perfectly legitimate to embrace it, at least initially, because of its extrinsic value. For example, because it can be helpful in the resistance to injustice. In light of solidarity's value as a tool for correcting injustice, it's reasonable, I think, to commit oneself to solidarity with others, provided these others are willing to commit themselves in a reciprocal way. And by doing so, you thereby are, um, are bound by the norms of solidarity. Now, I don't believe, as some black nationalists do, that black people have, if you like, a kind of fundamental duty, a really basic duty to sustain political unity. Black solidarity in, is uh, in the pursuit of racial justice, though, is, I think, um, a perfectly permissible and I think sometimes effective way to carry out the duty of justice. When one undertakes this commitment of solidarity, one thereby commits oneself to in-group obligations of loyalty, special concern, and mutual trust. Although black solidarity may not be the only way to fulfill the duty of justice, it is an approach that has proved valuable in earlier struggles, for example, against slavery and Jim Crow. Now here I want to draw your attention to the fact that moral commitment and individual virtue in, is important to creating and sustaining meaningful collective action against oppression. So if a member of the black elite acts politically solely out of self-interest, then I think either they don't understand what solidarity requires or they simply are rejecting uh, its demands as a, as, a, as a moral requirement. It may be that, from a strictly cost-benefit standpoint, the personal costs and risks to black elite of, say, openly fighting against anti-black racism, or racial inequality, that these might outweigh the personal benefits of participating in the collective effort. However, if black elites are so unprincipled, so selfish that they are simply uh, willing to compromise with these injustices, then I think any kind of solidarity that includes them is going to be ineffective or worse. Excuse me. <coughs> Whenever I'm speaking to a big room, <coughs> excuse me. When I'm speaking to a big room, I feel the need to um, 
speak loud, to reach people in the back even though I'm mic'd. <laughs> and I haven't learned how to kind of restrain myself from that, and it tends to make my throat kind of get agitated. So on, on the account of solidarity that I'm defending, self-interest is really only a supporting reason to commit to solidarity. These kind of interests can't really do their work by themselves, that is apart from ethical considerations and moral motivation. Although black people share many important interests, their interests are not entirely aligned. Even where there are common interests, there's gonna be the problem of free riding on the sacrifices of others. This is gonna inevitably occur in the absence of real, real loyalty to the group and its cause. Now, I don't doubt that openly condemning racial injustice can increase white racial resentment and hostility toward black people. However, on grounds of, of justice, on grounds of integrity and self-respect, I take it that black elites should not accommodate themselves to these sentiments. And so far as black elites are moved by a sense of justice and identification with other black people, consideration of self-interest can supply, if you like, a kind of secondary reason to contribute to the group's historical struggle against racial domination. There is ultimately, I think here, no philosophical solution to this challenge. The point here is to try to think about what philosophers might bring to thinking about the challenge. And I think that most of philosophers can do is to explain why there are good practical reasons, moral and prudential, for black people to cultivate and maintain solidarity despite existing class cleavages. The viability of black solidarity across class lines is gonna turn on whether there are a sufficient number of black elites who are willing to carry this collective project forward, even if this would involve some personal sacrifices or risks on their part. We turn to the second challenge. <clears throat> According to this challenge, black solidarity is a form of identity politics that reifies race and romanticizes so-called blackness and thereby obscures class differenti differentiation and divergent interest among black people. Many who call for black unity uncritically rely on the dubious race concept when they do so. They fail to appreciate that there are no races but only if you like a distorting racial ideology that legitimizes material inequality, legitimizes economic exploitation, and it does this by infusing social meaning into relatively superficial physical traits. Thank you. Race thinking makes blackness like whiteness seem, if you like, magical like a necessary feature of a meaningful and valuable life. Those who are in the thrall of blackness downplay significant differences among black people. They tend to exaggerate, if you like, differences between blacks and whites. And they sometimes aggressively guard the boundaries of black identity. These familiar dynamics generate if an unha unhealthy, in-group conformity and can silence dissent from presumed or perhaps largely illusory group consensus. And given the centrality of race to this outlook, racism becomes the singular focus of political energy, marginalizing the significance of other forms of injustice, particularly those arising from political economy. So that's the challenge. Now to respond, to this set of concerns, which I, again, I think are serious, we need some clarity about, if you like, the black in black solidarity in relation between blackness to uh, race and identity. So here to kind of fill out the philosophical conception of solidarity a little bit more, the five elements of solidarity I previously outlined, remember, Mutual identification, special concern, common values, and goals, group, lo group loyalty, and mutual trust. These constitute, if you like, solidarity's general form. Put a little bit of jargon in there. Now, 
I, th I think that all forms of group solidarity that have a chance of being effective at resisting injustice are going to have this kind of general moral form. Right. And I think we can distinguish different types of solidarity by two things. The criteria that are used for determining, determining membership in the group and the specific, specific values or goals to which these members jointly commit themselves. I think these two features constitute what I'm here calling the content of solidarity. And these two things work together. So who is black for purposes of black solidarity? I think it's helpful to distinguish between what I call thin blackness and uh, thick blackness. Now thin blackness is a category within a historically specific and socially imposed classificatory scheme. You don't have to believe that races are biological kinds to accept that there is such a social system of classification and that this classificatory scheme has practical consequences for the people who fall under it. The category black here functions mainly to mark off a set of individuals, here I'm focusing on the United States, on the basis of their having sub-Saharan African ancestry with visible inherited physical characteristics, here chiefly dark skin and tightly coiled hair, that are generally associated with the so-called Negro race. Thin blackness is an indelible mark, a salient social fact, and generally carries social stigma. A person can't really choose whether to be black or to stay black in this thin sense of blackness. Thick blackness, on the other hand, is, if you like, a social identity maybe an ethnic or cultural identity. That, and it can be adopted, it can be altered, it can be lost. It's often embraced as a positive dimension of a person's self-concept. Black identities are generally components of a conception of the fundamental aims of human life. Given a thick conception of blackness, it can make sense to encourage someone to, if you like, stay black or to hold firmly to their black heritage. It can also be coherent to say, that though someone is, say, unambig unambiguously black in a thin sense, that is, they clearly satisfy conventional descriptive criteria, racial classification, to say that they are, aren't really black, that is to say, they don't exhibit or subscribe to our favorite conception of thick blackness. This thin, th thick distinction is meant to distinguish, on the one hand, the unchosen aspects of blackness, from those dimensions that are subject to individual will. The distinction is not meant to deny that unchosen factors, whether these be biological factors or cultural factors, that these shape who we are. Not only is racial classification a matter of birth, many of us have been socialized into various practices of cultural blackness. We can't change these facts about ourselves. What we can do, though, is decide what significance we will attach to these facts. In particular, we can choose whether to posit positively identify with and thus affirm our blackness as a component of our self-concept. I've argued elsewhere that blacks in the thin sense should not demand a shared thick black identity as a condition of solidarity. Nor should black people treat the conservation or the valorization of thick blackness as a defining element of black solidarity. Now, this doesn't mean that black people must, say, abandon all recognizable genres of thick blackness if they're to share bonds of solidarity. Nor does it mean that those who choose to celebrate their thick blackness can't draw on their identity right, as a source of strength and inspiration in the fight for justice. And I am emphatically not saying that thin blackness and the stigma it carries is all there is to being black. I would, however, urge greater tolerance toward different views about the meaning and value of different thick black identities, and perhaps maybe somewhat more controversially. I think that such tolerance should even be extended to those who, though thinly black, reject all modes of blackness as defining a positive sense of self. The criteria for thin blackness, I think, is all that's needed to determine group membership 
and thick blackness should not be a requirement for full standing in the group. Moreover, the category of thin blackness is all that's really needed to enforce anti-discrimination law. The targets for anti-black racism are people who are thinly black, satisfy the criteria of thin blackness. Well, this thin blackness is thought of as a kind of sign of inferiority, as a mark of a supposedly deeper difference. In this way, what we do is we emphasize the link between the criteria for who is black and the point of black solidarity, which is to resist and possibly end racial injustice. The attribution of thin blackness makes all black people vulnerable to racism and thus makes the common experience of racial mistreatment possible. It's this common experience, I think, not thin blackness, that generates spontaneous black bonds. The precise content of black solidarity is defined here not only by the criteria of group membership, but also, of course, by the specific aims and values that those who in solidarity commit themselves to. The substantive content has appropriately shifted with historical circumstances. Right? In past areas by people focus their energies on ending slavery or ending Jim Crow or fighting ghettoization. Sometimes they're fighting discrimination more generally. In the current era, black people still face many challenges, some of them old, some of them new. There's continued discrimination in various arenas, housing, lending, employment, law enforcement. There are a wide range of troubling racial disparities and wealth, educational opportunity and academic achievement, access to health care and health outcomes, employment and incarceration rates. And these are, uh, in part, a legacy of racial subordination and exploitation of past eras. There's the persistence of ghetto poverty and its associated ills, ills like teenage pregnancy and joblessness and high dropout rates, unstable families, crime, and mass incarceration. There are also deep in-group cleavages, not only along the lines of class, but also along the lines of gender and sexuality and, and uh, of generation and national origin. And there's the general social climate within the United States in which most people, even many who are ostensibly committed to racial equality and anti-racism, are frankly simply tired of hearing about black people's grievances and problems. You might call that a kind of racial fatigue and are now inclined to believe that black people continue to lag behind whites largely because of self-defeating attitudes and refusal to take advantage of existing opportunity. Any attempt to specify the appropriate content for contemporary black solidarity has to take into account these and other social factors that define, if you like, the post-civil rights era in the United States. Now, in view of these circumstances that black people currently face, I'm going to tentatively suggest that the content, the specific goals, goals and, and aims of black solidarity, should be understood as a joint commitment to anti-racist values and to the goals of reducing racial disparities and ending poverty. In a phrase, black solidarity in the post-Jim Crow era should be fundamentally concerned with advancing a racial justice and anti-poverty agenda. And I conceive of, if you like, black interest within the context of group solidarity as interest that it is reasonable to expect all black people to commit to advancing and that black people share because they are black. Now, remember, we all have a duty of justice, so it's going to be reasonable to expect black people to do their part to correct ongoing injustices and to rectify harms due to past wrongs. Everybody has that responsibility. But because they are black here in a thin sense, all black people have a tangible and durable interest in ending racial injustice, especially those forms rooted in anti-black prejudice and bias. And it's going to be rational here, understood in a, in, a, in a strictly instrumental means in sense, for black people to support a joint effort to further this cause, provided they have reason to believe this cooperative venture has some prospects for success. It's undoubtedly true that not every racist idea or type of racial injustice affects all black people. And among the forms of racism that do affect all blacks, they obviously don't affect all black people in the same way or equally. 
Moreover, there are racist stereotypes that target specific black subgroups rather than all black people. There's a stereotype about poor, the, the, the so-called poor female welfare chief, and there's a stereotype about young male, the young male criminal. However, the widespread assumption that black people are, say, intellectually inferior, lazy, prone to violence, right? These kinds of stereotypes certainly affect all black people negatively, even if it does so in different ways, in different contexts. And the stereotype, uh, even about something like the young black male criminal, that kind of stereotype um, can negatively affect blacks who aren't young or male. The specific political content of black solidarity is now and has really always been contested among black people, and rightly so, I think. Such disagreement, which is often quite deep, is not simply about which strategies will be best, something you got to expect in any solidarity group, right? But also about basic values and ultimate aims. Not all black people have the same conception of social justice. Right? Not even racial justice. And black people disagree about the degree to which racial injustice remains a problem. And they certainly disagree about the underlying causes of black disadvantage. Now these facts, I think they really shouldn't surprise us. They shouldn't alarm us either. After all, black people they don't constitute a political party, right? They aren't, marg they are a marginalized social group. So there can't be a, if you like, an official political platform. Right? And no one should expect black people to subscribe to the same political philosophy. Still, I think black people do have concrete practical interests that converge around an agenda that I've outlined and that there is a stable consensus even that these fundament, about these fundamental values and goals, what I've elsewhere called a, a, a kind of black constitution. And these things are largely cut across various ideological differences, differences in political philosophy. Now, there's nothing in this, uh, this kind of account that precludes or discourages debate about the specific values and goals that, black, that should underpin black solidarity. Even this black consensus is not immune to amendment, in my view. In fact, it has changed over time in response to debate and altered circumstances. I do believe that we should be slow, if you like, to make changes and that the burden of proof should be on those who propose such changes. Or well, why? Two reasons, I think. First, I think these consensus values and goals here, not race, not identity, are really the glue that holds the group together. And this group cohesion, when accompanied by sufficient numbers, is the primary source of the group's political power and collective efficacy. I'm not saying that black people as a collective would be, say, powerless without black solidarity. There's multiracial coalitions, there's a kind of modus vivendi, black politics, these things are perfectly available. But I do think it's fair to say that a black politics that refuses to rely on black solidarity would be needlessly discarding what historically has been the group's greatest weapon of self-defense and group advancement. Second, as black people debate what values and goals they should be committed to here in the post-Jim Crow era, they should not regard themselves as starting from scratch. There's really been a long black debate over many generations about how to respond to white domination and its consequences. Through this historical debate, black people have forged their current political consensus. And here at the risk of sounding like a Burkean conservative, I believe that there is wisdom in these traditional black ideas. There is no doubt error too, some of which I try to expose in my book. But ultimately my goal is to draw out and defend the essential truths of black political common sense. Without these shared values and goals, we can't really make sense of the idea of group loyalty and mutual trust, which are partly constitutive in my view of solidarity. Loyalty and trustworthiness are judged in terms of fidelity to the group's values and goals. So we determine whether a person is, is sufficiently loyal. The traitor, if you like, or the sellout is the person who fails to be faithful to the group's values and goals. And I think most black people have a rough sense of what these values and goals entail, even if they disagree about their precise content. 
My aim in identifying and defending these shared values and goals is rooted in the objective of demonstrating the cogency and the viability of black solidarity in the face of skepticism, particularly skepticism on the left, not in a desire to provide, if you like, some kind of indubitable, found, indubitable foundations for black political practice or to try to prevent debate about the content of black solidarity. Now, black people could, of course, jointly commit themselves to promoting a social justice agenda that reaches far beyond fighting racism and racial injustice and anti-poverty, and by all means, they should. But for a variety of reasons that I tried to explain in We Who Are Dark, I think this kind of joint commitment to a really broad progressive agenda is unlikely to form among black people. We simply can't expect that kind of political cohesiveness within such a diverse and internally stratified social group. I still think a progressive form of black solidarity is possible and desirable, though, but it would be unwise, I think, to downplay or to ignore its limits. A third challenge. Black elites tend to distance themselves from and generally have contempt for the black poor, or at best, they act on paternalistic noblesse oblige, which is naturally insulting and alienating for the black poor. <clears throat> many black elites don't identify with the black poor. Indeed, many abhor what they take to be the black poor's habits, attitudes, and lifestyle. They think the black poor tend to have self-defeating values, that they behave irresponsibly, that they fail to take advantage of opportunities. The result, they feel, is that the public image of blacks is damaged. Stereotypes get, to be, get reinforced, and therefore black identities become further stigmatized. Moreover, black elites often resent the fact that the so-called so -called ghetto modes of blackness are viewed in the wider society as representative of black life. So they seek to distance themselves from poor blacks, or sometimes they support measures that aim to make the black poor conform to mainstream values. And from the point of view of the black poor, as you might expect, these kinds of judgments and attitudes are naturally regarded as unacceptable and offensive. That's the third challenge. Here I'll be briefer. Even if these criticisms of the black poor have merit, I think the social structure that poor blacks have inherited and, confront, and they, that they confront is, I think, manifestly unfair. Moreover, the black poor, like many other blacks, are burdened by the legacy of past injustices. Thus, even if the black poor could do more to help themselves, as some people contend, as a matter of simple justice, they are nonetheless entitled to, for instance, good schools and better job opportunities, decent housing to a fair criminal justice system, and so on. Disapproval of the choices that the black poor make in response to their unfair circumstances, I don't think that really justifies abstaining from actions that would improve the circumstances, in this case, the unjust social structure, that they face. It's well known that class differences correlate strongly with differences in lifestyle and taste. Black people are not immune to this, of course. But I don't see any reason to suppose that black people must have a similar lifestyle or approve of one another's lifestyles to share a commitment to fight together for racial justice. Black people can respect, or at the minimum, they can tolerate diverse ways of living as a black person while working in concert to remove unfair burdens that the group faces. Over black people don't have to love each other to have solidarity. Recall, it's the, commi the commitment of solidarity, right? This should be distinguished from, if you like, feelings of solidarity, and even from liking those with whom one has solidarity. The commitment can, of course, um, be accompanied by, and it can be, be prompted by such feelings of solidarity towards, one, towards one's comrades. And, but it's, these feelings are not really the foundation of solidarity, as I see it. Such positive sentiments are neither necessary nor sufficient. I take it one can be a steadfast, can be steadfast in one's commitment and yet lack the feelings, and one can possess the feelings without undertaking or honoring the commitment. This can be clear from cases of love, for instance. In addition, the feeling of solidarity is often spontaneous, a kind of spontaneous emotional response. It's not really an act of will, like a commitment or a vow. Right? But the commitment that often springs from such sentiments need not be reflective and is certainly never uh, 
involuntary. Those with the feeling of solidarity, just like those who fall in love, they still have to decide whether, when, and how to act on that sentiment. Feelings of affection and affinity would not deny that they can have a profound uh, effect in creating greater cohesion within the group. And such sentiments can be a powerful motivating force when the going gets, gets tough. But solidarity, I would argue, is ultimately a kind of ethical commitment, not a feeling. Fourth challenge. Black elites, they don't really care, I'm um, sorry, they do care about racism, but they don't have a stake in ending black poverty. It might be thought that although black elites have a vested interest in defending civil rights, preserving affirmative action, enforcing anti-discrimination laws, things like that, they don't really have a stake in ending black poverty and its associated ills. After all, black elites are no longer forced to live in segregated poor neighborhoods and not relegated to the low-skilled labor market. They don't depend on public assistance to meet their basic needs. They have highly valued and scarce skills which enable them to get high-paying jobs and they protect them from the, the precarious lives of the black poor. Though black elites may empathize with the plight of the black poor, there's little reason to believe that they are invested in actively fighting poverty. Conversely, the black poor are primarily concerned with, if you like, bread and butter issues. Right? They need to acquire jobs to pay a living wage. Right? They've got to find affordable housing and safe neighborhoods. They need decent schools for their children and basic public services. They need access to inexpensive, inexpensive and efficient public transportation. Right? They're facing a police state that is highly punitive and violent toward the black poor. And the most dangerous stereotypes target the black urban poor are not really black people in general. Black elites and the black poor are not, therefore, having the same black experience. In light of these differences in interest and, and, uh, and priorities, it's not really realistic to expect solidarity that cuts across this vast class divide. That's the challenge. <clears throat> Here, a brief response. The existence of black slums, the achievement gap in education, High black jobless rates, racialized mass incarceration, these are all, in the minds of many, conspicuous confirmation of familiar negative black stereotypes. That black people are unintelligent, that black people are lazy, irresponsible, imprudent, and violent. Those in the grip of these stereotypes are often disposed to interpret these disturbing racial disparities, not as a sign that there are further racial injustices to address, but as empirical support for their low opinion of black people and often as justification for the resistance to policies that might create greater racial equality. Therefore, sharply reducing these disparities and eradicating ghetto, ghetto poverty is, I think, in the interest of black elites, appearances notwithstanding. If blackness is stigmatized because of its association with intellectual inferiority, indolence, irresponsibility, and crime, as I think it clearly is, the black elites have a stake in breaking that association. As Du Bois often lamented, the black population in America is generally judged by the behavior and condition of its most debased members. And the condition of the worst off is treated as a sign of the inferiority of black people generally. Moreover, the black elite, or at least some of their kin, are sometimes mistaken for members of the black poor and are mistreated as a result. This can have deadly consequences for advantaged blacks when the abuse comes at the hands of the police. Such facts, I think, give black elites a, pla a practical reason to be personally invested in the eradication of ghetto poverty. However, quite apart from their personal stake in eliminating black urban poverty, black elites should, I think, on grounds of solidarity, do their part to alleviate the burdens of the black poor. Again, recall that solidarity entails what I call special concern. This is a commitment to aid one's comrades in need, even if doing so, if in doing so, one receives no reciprocal benefit. Now, of course, it would be utopian and impractical to expect broad-based solidarity in the absence of any kind of shared interest. I'm not suggesting that you know, morality can do it all. Interests matter. 
there will always be some he heroic and self-sacrificing self individuals who are going to commit themselves to solidarity with others in the cause of justice despite having little or nothing to gain personally. That does happen. But most of us, unfortunately, are not moral heroes. We often need incentives to live up to our political commitments. In the absence of a personal stake in the outcome of a political struggle, we find ourselves often without the will to contribute much to the fight. Yes, as I've emphasized, it would also be a mistake to attempt to ground solidarity solely in shared interest. Ethical commitment is critical. Final challenge. Given the divided allegiances of the black elite, the black poor, who are really, some would say, members of the working class, should simply make common cause with workers of other racial groups. To secure the interests of the black poor, a radical transformation of society needs to occur. Although the black elite uh, often and can be expected to oppose racial discrimination, they don't really have a stake in preserving, I'm sorry, they do have a, a, a stake in supporting the economic status quo. That is, the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few, and sometimes the power that comes with it, low taxes on high income earners, great economic inequality, where the benefits of economic growth go largely to investors and to the professional managerial classes. Moreover, as Cornell West points out, black elites preoccupation with white peer recognition could lead them to be somewhat overly invested in standards of evaluation or merit that buttress our highly unequal social order. Indeed, if black elites were to get what most seem to want, namely their it's like racially proportionate share of status, income, and wealth, this would still leave us with a whole lot of deeply disadvantaged black people. Even if the black poor were to face no racial prejudice and their fortunes were no worse than poor whites, they would still be poor and thus at the mercy of the rich and powerful. That's the challenge. Now this assessment seems to me it's basically correct. The black poor should seek multiracial working class solidarity and participate in the labor movement. But they should also maintain solidarity with other black people to fight racial injustices and anti-black racism. To be perfectly honest, I don't think there are any perfect allies awaiting the black poor. There are deep cleavages within the working class as well as many among the working class seem to identify more strongly with rich whites than with disadvantaged people of other racial groups. And so it seems to me, as it did to Du Bois in the 1940s, that the black proletariat, if you like, and even the black lumpen proletariat, should not abandon its traditional ties to progressive elements among the black elite. In an important, I think, but neglected essay by Cornel West called The Paradox of African American Rebellion, he takes a position on the black elite that still strikes me as entirely apt. He argues that the black freedom struggle could not be re-energized without a critical mass of what people sometimes call the new middle class, the professional managerial elite. Black elites possess vital skills, resources, and power, and most black people still look to them for leadership. But black progressives and the black working class have to hold black elites accountable and push them beyond, if you like, the neoliberal reformism. Let me wrap up. I think there's no question that black solidarity is currently fragile and has been really for a number of decades. Black people are not as cohesive as they were during past eras, when very few could expect to acquire significant wealth, status, or power, and almost every black person's life prospects were far below that of the average white person. It can be difficult to trust those that clearly benefit from the status quo and have something to lose by participating in the collective struggle. Black unity cannot therefore be the emancipatory tool it was and once was in earlier eras. Nostalgic calls for the degree of solidarity characteristic of the civil rights era are unhelpful. And we can't expect black solidarity to be the solution to every social injustice that affects black people. Nor is it, I think, the best vehicle for all the hopes and aspirations for progressives and leftists. Yet, 
When it comes to things like demanding racial justice, to demanding greater racial equality, and attempting to end ghetto poverty and its associated ills, I still think that black solidarity can serve a progressive, indeed a critical function. Now, I realize that some might prefer a more uh, inspiring conclusion, but I think for the philosopher, our role is to say what we think is true and correct, and this is my judgment. Thanks so much. Professor, Professor Tommy Shelby. Now it's, I'm ready to so collect questions. We're going to open it to questions. If you want to hand cards over. Why don't we start with a question from the online audience, if we have any, Joanna? We're asking you to mm -hmm. dig a little deeper into this, def or in a different direction, maybe, into this definition of solidarity. So. You've talked about the distinction between the feeling of solidarity that might arise spontaneously mm -hmm. versus this ethical commitment to it. Mm -hmm. So if an individual, whether in the elite or the working class or the poor, has this ethical commitment to solidarity, what kinds of actions would that spur in their life? Good. Good. Well, I think probably the thing that will be most relevant here, right, is to, is to see actions that where don't seem entirely self-serving. <laughs> You know, so uh, in particular actions that might seem to risk some status or some benefits of having a higher position in a society. So it, I think it's not unreasonable for the most disadvantaged in a group. And I think this is not just true of, of black solidarity, but other forms of group solidarity where there are always some more advantaged members and some, some members who are, are more deeply disadvantaged. The more dis deeply disadvantaged members of a solidarity group will be looking for signs of fidelity from the more, more advantaged members, right? And those signs will have to be things that um, suggest that the person is willing to, to make some sacrifices, um, to do some things that might not just serve their, serve their interests. And that seems perfectly reasonable to me. Um, I think sometimes in the past, people have tried to rely on, um, if you like, cultural signs of blackness, if you like sort of uh, uh, what I'm here to call it, you know, thick black identities. So a fidelity to a thick black identity is seen as, uh, as, as, as a kind of fidelity to the cause of a racial justice. I just think that that is, is, is no longer reliable, if it ever was a reliable sign of fidelity to the cause. So I think you're going to want more concrete, um, partly because I think there, there, there are many, one can be committed to having a, a full sense of, of thick black identity for reasons that don't have to do with one's politics. Moreover, um, uh, because many black people uh, uh, in, with any form of loyalty, there's always the, the worry that people might betray the group in, in, in some way, and people are often on, on, on the lookout for that. And since many black people are very invested in having a black identity and having the community that comes with being with other black people, it's very easy to exhibit characteristics that affirm that sense of, of, of collective identity without necessarily committing oneself to, to, to the cause uh, in, in ways that might um, hit the bottom line, if you like. And we hit my microphone. Sorry about that little squeal there. That's when you walk in front of a, a speaker with a microphone. This is a question from our friend Professor Jordan asks, are abstract but real concepts such as love or sentimental attachments to less well-off blacks a point of your considerations? Is the irrational notion of simple love for all kinds of black people by elites and working class uh, folk a significant foundation for the development of political solidarity? Actually, interesting. I mean, Cornell West, in his um, famous book, uh, Race Matters, uh, uses the language of love uh, and rather than the language of solidarity. And, 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 and I think that some of this is a verbal thing, and it's not, it's not a substantive thing. Some of it is substantive. Um, um, so to be clear, I don't think, I, I don't mean to be suggesting that love for black people cannot be a uh, cohesive, a uh, 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 force for cohesion in the group or uh, a, a motivation for fighting for the group. I think it can, and I think it's, it's very clear that that's the, the case. My, my point was just whether it will be required, um, partly because I think that there are uh, cleavages and divides within the group where it puts, they put people at odds and, um, and where it's harder for people to have the same level of affection for other members of, of the group that maybe they once had. Uh, so my point was that it, it was to make that point, but also to make the point that what's, what, what binds the group together 
uh, is is really the commitment or 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 or, or vow to the group to, to be loyal to the group and to advance its objectives and aims. And that that can be done even in the absence of strong affinity and strong, a, a strong sense of affection for the other members of the, of, of the group. Um, it can be a principal commitment to the group even if those, those kinds of deeper sentiments are not, are not there. I did not mean to deny that those deeper sentiments are often um, uh, play a strong role in why some people take the actions that they do on behalf of, of black people, and particularly the most disadvantaged among them. All right, here is a question from H. Richard Penn about affirmative action. So they ask, will the elite lose influence over time should the Supreme Court rule against the mm -hmm. Harvard admission process? It's gonna go right to the home, right? So <laughs> um, uh, it's a good question. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't know, um, frankly. I mean, I think in a lot of higher education, uh, the, the leaders in higher education, especially at the most selective colleges, are generally committed to ensuring that they have a diverse student body. I don't know that that will, will, will go away, even if there are challenges to front of back. I think people will, will, will try to make an effort to, um, continue to create diverse student body, especially, I, I think it's particularly important at the selective colleges because often uh, they are the source of, of leadership um, that, comes, that comes later. And I think it's important to have a diverse, diverse leadership. Uh, so, but yeah, it would, make a, it would have, be a huge hit if it turned out that that wasn't the case. If it turns out that you have a dramatic reduction in the number of black people who have access to uh, higher education um, then that's going to have a big impact on um, on the leadership class. What kind of leaders you can have? You need to have members of uh, what I'm here calling the black elite who play the role of of, of not, you know university leaders and who are who are, are lawyers and, and 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 doctors and who run organ nonprofit organizations and businesses and the like. And a, a dramatic reduction in the number of black people in those roles is going to would have a, a I think a quite deep negative impact on the efficacy of black solidarity for um, bringing about racial justice. I think that's, that's undeniable. A question here. Um, what do you see as the potential of black solidarity not only to mobilize for racial justice, but also to push against other debatably growing divides in US society? For example, divisions between urban and rural, or those with higher education without? Mm -hmm. when, when I think of solidarity, I don't think of it as a purely partisan endeavor, group partisan endeavor, right? So it's not, it's meant to be a principled commitment, right? So you don't, it's, it's not that the, there's, there are ways of thinking about solidarity, and, and here again, I start with uh, focusing on the influence of, uh, of a Marxist paradigm of solidarity focuses on the working class. Marx often thought of the working class as, is, is, is principally motivated by shared material interest. They take action, to fight against and ultimately abolish capitalism because they have a material interest in that outcome. And he tended to downplay the significance of ethical considerations in that struggle. And I think that's a mistake for understanding solidarity, not only in the working class case, but in other cases as well. Um, uh, so I think it's, 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 it's uh, important when you emphasize those ethical considerations to realize that, it, 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 that these have to be principal stances, right? So if those who are, interested in, in ending poverty, it's not like you just want to focus on ending poverty for, for black people. You, you, you want to end poverty for, for everyone. Uh, for those who are committed to uh, resisting racial injustice, it's not just that you want to end anti-black racism. Um, you're interested in other forms of, of racism and racial marginalization as well. Because again, this is, the, this is why it's so critical to, well, on the one hand, to acknowledge this, the importance of having shared interest and maintain solidarity, you have to be realistic about these things. This is politics and interests matter. But you also have to, to uh, pay proper attention to moral considerations. And in this case, I think those considerations um, bind us all and uh, enjoin us to take a principled stance against the forms of injustice that we fight against, not just in a purely group partisan way, but in a way that's mindful of uh, a, a broader uh, concerns of justice. 
about the role of religious organizations in the dynamics you described today. So especially because um, religious organizations have been such a primary mover in the fight for social justice, I'm curious about your reflections on the ways in which religious organizations can either challenge or can at times serve to ossify these kind of social divisions. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think, trying to go on too much on this question, it's, it's a good one. Um, I mean, for a, for a very long time, religious organizations were, the, were really the only formal forms of social organization that black people really had. Um, reaching back to the era of slavery, um, and even through much of Jim Crow, uh, it, it, it was a, a critical organization because you need a place where people can have open debate, where they can, um, a place where people can have political education, where they can um, uh, uh, draw people together for mobilization purposes and so on, and this was critical, and it was critical all the way through the civil rights movement. Um, uh, I think there's still a, a, a role for that, but, but I think there are many other vehicles for a political organization than there once were. Uh, do, during Jim Crow, black people have other forms of civic organization and other uh, other ways of of, of of creating a forum for discussion and debate than they once have. So I think there's still a, still a role to play. Uh, but, it, but again, like one part of my work is to, and this is in a way in which I agree with some of the leftist criticisms of black solidarity, is to not downplay the significance of of um, of of the variety of ways of being a black person in America. And that variety includes uh, religious diversity. People have a range of religious views. Some people are not very religious, religious at all. And I don't think you want to, given that we don't have to, uh, as we may once have had to, rely on uh, religious organizations for modes of organization, I think we should extend the range of organizations and be somewhat more tolerant of uh, disagreement about religion, including its its role in public life, than maybe we once uh, were. Um, but I don't think I don't think this it's a particularly uh, acute form of division within the black population in the way in which perhaps some other, uh, uh, including class differences, are. Uh, but it does represent a one site of, of of disagreement and cleavage that I think shouldn't be ignored. Thank you. We have a question here. Um, you mentioned a Burkean conservatism towards the black constitution. Do you have a conservative attitude to all politics that leads to progressive conclusions or a progressive attitude towards politics, broadly speaking, uh, and, uh, and thus, and just a conservative attitude in this one respect? <laughs> I didn't, I shouldn't have said that probably. Uh, I like Burke. Uh, I think he gets some things right. Um, but. The point I was trying to make there is, um, and this is this is a Burkean point in a way, that over many generations you might have practices and institutions whose origins you might lose sight of uh, that people have learned from. I think this is true in the case of Black Solidarity, which has existed now for many many decades across many generations, and um, there's wisdom in black political common sense that has been forged through that long, through that long struggle. And my point was that you don't, you don't have to sort of, as Foster sometimes do, try to start from scratch. Okay, as if like there's no, there's no, you know, if we were going to have black solidarity. What would we do? You know, it's like this is something we we know a lot about it. We've learned a lot about it over time. And my thought was that one should respect the the work of previous generations and trying to fight for black liberation by uh, giving some weight to what they've learned. And that is a conservative thought, if you like, uh, and I probably would extend that to other, to other arenas, uh, but, but in this case, uh, I, I think it, it is a, a positive point in favor of uh, uh, at least a particular way of thinking about black solidarity. Another question here online from Samantha Turner, who is kind of trying to grapple with the, the tension between, on the one hand, this clearly moral imperative that you've, you've outlined today, and what she calls racialized capitalistic greed. Mm. So ha greed is a powerful thing. How do we fight past that to get to solidarity? I wish I knew. 
Um, you know, one of the things I've learned, I mean, I'm a student of, of black political thought and spent a lot of time reading um, black thinkers from, um, from the 18th century um, uh, forward. Um, and one of the things that's emphasized in that is the, the importance of what I sometimes call the political ethics of the oppressed. So that you don't, you don't think of uh, the members of oppressed groups as simply just thinking, oh, okay, we have this common problem. What's the right strategy to how to, to, how to solve it? But you think that there's such a thing as, is uh, uh, how do you live in a dignified way under conditions of, of injustice? What sorts of virtues should one cultivate? What sorts of what ways should one relate to other people in a moral way despite living under very unjust circumstances? I think that the black tradition has a, a lot of reflection on this question, which includes um, uh, 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 avoiding the, the temptation to um, uh, uh, to be attracted only to dollars, right? If you think of the uh, W. B. Du Bois's famous critique of of Booker T. Washington and the Souls of Black Folk, there's a one of the chapters is uh, of the Wings of Atalanta, and if you haven't read it, I, I would suggest reading it. It's a reflection on exactly this issue. It's a reflection on how. Booker T. Washington's vision, which is built on kind of a, a kind of black capitalism, um, that we should be skeptical of this vision because it's uh, it, 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 it's a uh, it's it's not a way that uh, one should live. It's not it's not a road to human flourishing to be concerned only with amassing great wealth. And there's a temptation, he thought, was true of Washington, to just follow the currents in American society uh, toward the chasing of dollars and to forgetting about the other things to make a life worthwhile. So I, 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 I don't know, practically speaking, how to make that kind of vision effective, but I do think that the, the resources are already there in the black tradition to try to push against um, the temptation to be overly concerned with uh, amassing money way to frame it in terms of going with the current or kind of trying to reshape the current. Um, so I have one more question for you here, which is about education. So even given the really grave issues of unequal access in education, what opportunities do you see for the classroom to be a place to cultivate this kind of black solidarity? Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, well, I went to a historically black college, to Florida A&M. Um, and part of the attraction of being in an institution like that, I mean, there, it wasn't, it was, there were students who were not black, it, but there was majority black students. And, and it was a commitment to the, of those institutions to try to uh, cultivate leadership uh, for, for black people. I think that, that commitment is retained to some extent in that, in, in that, in that context. Um, but that's a kind of special context. There are, there are, there are other contexts where it, uh, you know, I don't. I don't think that um, that the UNC is going to commit itself to <laughs> to, to, to to such a thing. Uh, but probably nor should it. Um, but I think that um, doesn't mean that the you, you you couldn't cultivate similar sorts of uh, attitudes, commitments, and uh, sentiments and commitments through the teaching of black history and black struggle. And I think part of what I try to do as a professor in an African American studies department is to try to treat, teach that tradition of, of struggle, which has been an inspiration really to uh, many other groups fighting for justice to, to sort of see the role of, of black people in trying to bring down slavery and the, the role of black people in bringing down uh, the, uh, Jim Crow to try to create uh, equal citizenship for everyone and other people emulate that approach to fighting against injustice. And they can, and I think through that, you can see the value of something like black solidarity, the role it can play, even though it can sometimes have excesses that should be criticized. Um, you can see in, th there are forms of it that we should all affirm and that other groups can, can, can learn from. And so I don't think that that's inimical, inimical to anything that uh, will be an appropriate part of an educational mission um, and I think it's something that uh, 
uh, one, one needn't view as some kind of simple celebration of blackness, right? But rather as a celebration of the, what the, the best of America, the best of the United States, of uh, those times when ordinary citizens bound together, found a way to against the odds to try to make the place better, to try to make the place more just. And telling that story in our classroom, in the class, in the things that we teach, put it in our curriculum, having a, a topic of conversation is something that I think can encourage um, uh, uh, the, the kind of attitudes I think we want um, to see amongst our fellow citizens. Uh, thank you for that. We have um, only time for one more question. I'm sorry for that. Um, in the spirit of fairness, I'm going to shuffle these and, and pick one out. Um, but I do want to make sure you know we're going to keep these questions and be able to present them to Professor Shelby tomorrow during the, uh, the follow-up session we have tomorrow. So we're going to keep these and present them to you tomorrow. But let's pick one randomly. Uh, here we go. Um, uh, could you apply how your analysis plays out in public policy activism for things like defund the police and school vouchers, et cetera? It's always risky to ask a philosopher to weigh in on a, po a public policy question. <laughs> we tend to work at general principles. And um, I mean, when it comes to, to questions of policy, of course, it, it, you know, there's, you have the constraint of political feasibility. You also have the, 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 the constraint that it, it requires deep empirical knowledge to be able to make a proposal, uh, to the response to make a, a public policy proposal. So, um, so those, are those, are, those are complex questions, especially in the educational domain. I think when it comes to something like de defund the police, I mean, this is something that is, um, could not be considered a part of what I'm here calling the black constitution or a kind of consensus value. This is, a, this is a place where I think black people and others are debating about the role of the police in American society. So you can't treat it as something that we already have a clear view of what we ought to be committed to. Um, it's, a, it's one of those live questions uh, about what our objectives should be and about what strategies would be important for protecting the interests of the most vulnerable in the society. Um, so I don't think uh, something like the kind of analysis I'm giving can deliver a verdict on something like defund the, poli defund the police, except to say that I, 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 I tried to emphasize that the conception of black solidarity that I would defend has to leave a space for open debate about questions that arise with new circumstances. And I think this is one of those things that is very much um, a matter of live, live debate, and not only, of course, at, amongst black people. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Shelby, and I want to note that there is a reception outside. There's food and drink, and uh, we will continue this discussion tomorrow morning. On your program, you can see a list of the people who will be responding to Professor Shelby. I will not call out all their names right here, but please join us on Zoom tomorrow morning. It's going to be a continuation of the conversation. Thank you so much. There are also copies of his books outside, and there are food, there are pieces of food and things to drink. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks.